before I set my Bible down. <laughs> okay, tonight we're in the book of Acts. We're looking at Acts chapter 23, and the Lord willing, we'll be looking at verses 11 through 22, the message entitled, Little Pitchers Have Big Ears, part one. Acts chapter 23, verses 11 through 22. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. And they were more than forty which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye, with the council, signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though ye would inquire of something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who hath something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldst bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them which more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee? So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed me these things. Here ends the reading of God's word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Gracious Heavenly Father, we live in a very dangerous age, as did Paul. And yet you use even weak instruments to accomplish your perfect will. You had promised Paul that he was going to get to Rome, and you used a little boy to help get him there. Father, we thank you for your word and for its power, and pray that you will bless it to our hearts tonight. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we're looking at this passage tonight, we should have a little bit of historical background. I'll only give you a little bit of it. There's much more that could be said on this. But the Jews at the time of Christ, the Jewish leaders in particular, had a group of professional assassins called the Sicarii. They were named after the short curved knives that they carried when they were busy with their assassinations. If there was someone who needed to be killed, needed in quotations, the Sicarii would go out, being sent forth by the Sanhedrin of the high priest, would surround that individual in a crowded place like a market or somewhere else, and as they surrounded him, they would take out their knives and just twist the knife up and stab him to death, pull the knife back and walk away as his body dropped to the ground. We have an illustration of that kind of thing going on here tonight. You do not see any kind of a, a negative response by the council, by the high priest, by any members of the Sanhedrin. This was business as usual. We can't get him on other means, but these were men who were willing to, well, as your modern day terrorists would do, take their own lives to accomplish the goal of their God. Willing to blow themselves up, if you would. You see that kind of thing all through history, of course. You see it in Vietnam. You've seen it today with the ISIS terrorists, with the Muslim suicide bombers, World Trade Center. 
the flight that was downed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. There are people like that, folks. They're in this world. Someday there may be some like that in this church. You need to understand that they do it for religious reasons. Oh, many different religions, many different evil religions. But they do it because they think they're serving God. Paul thought that he was serving God when he was killing Christians. Now the Zakarii think they're serving God by plotting an assassination attempt on the life of the Apostle Paul. That brings us back to the foundation we talked about last week. What you sow, you reap. The law of harvest is in our text, even when you're forgiven for the things that are past. Even if God's going to use you in a mighty way, there are still elements and seeds of the law of harvest. It's almost like moths in your house. I thought that I had gotten rid of all the moths over at the manse. I killed moths last year like you would not believe. I bought these electric fly swatters down at Harbor Freight Tools, <laughs> and they are great, by the way. Uh, if, if you go into the man's kitchen the way I used to kill moths, they would always land on the ceilings of the kitchen. And so I had a, a little short step ladder. I'd get up and I'd smush them with my thumb because they're really hard to catch like this. They dodge you too easily. But when they're lighted, you can push them with your thumb. So I'm not going to invite any of you in to see this, but if you go into my kitchen right now, you will see little smudged moths all over the ceiling of the kitchen. <laughs> haven't had a chance to clean them up yet. You'll see some of them on the walls here and there because that's the easy way to kill them. But you know what? Even though I killed moths like crazy and I have put mothballs all over the place, this afternoon I was up in the bedroom and there was another moth. I didn't have a fly swatter or one of those electric swatters. I got him with my hands. I was so happy. I actually got that one. <laughs> How did I get off on that? Oh, law of harvest. <laughs> what you sow, you reap. <laughs> I have no idea how I sowed those moth eggs, but I tell you, they keep coming back and they keep coming back. It's like the law of harvest. The things that you have in your resume, which we talked about weeks ago, will come back at some point to haunt you. Paul had beaten and killed Christians with legal authority. Now he is about to be assassinated, if they have their way, under legal authority. He's arrested and carried into the castle under legal authority. He's about to be assassinated under legal authority. Things that are legal are not always necessarily right, and we've talked about those things like abortion and sodomy and so on. So the lessons that we've learned so far is first, your true resume may include some things of which you're later ashamed. Paul witnessed the stoning of Stephen with approval and he killed Christians. But you know, those things, if they are viewed from God's perspective, can be used by God to motivate you to greater zeal when you understand the extreme nature of forgiveness. Now remember that phrase. The extreme nature of forgiveness. Most of us don't think of forgiveness that way because we don't think of our sin as viciously and violently and ugly and brutally hateful to God. We think of our sins as little sins. And when you think of your sins as little sins, you know what? You don't think much of forgiveness. It's not very valuable to you. But when you understand that Sin in the sight of a holy God is all filthy and heinous and ugly and vile and stenching. Then you begin to understand what I have called the extreme nature of forgiveness. Until you see your sin as bad as God sees it, you will never understand forgiveness. You will never understand the extreme nature of forgiveness forgiveness. The second thing that we've learned is these were things that Paul was ashamed of, but he didn't try to hide them from his resume because they were a useful tool that proved the grace of God. That was the second major lesson that we've learned so far. Paul was ashamed of these things, but he didn't hide them because they were a useful tool proving the grace of God in his life. When you understand the grace of God, suddenly the things that you've done in the past enable you to give a testimony 
concerning the grace of God. Forgiveness and grace, until you understand your own sin, you will never understand or value either forgiveness or grace. Oh, how we've lost that. We so much like to talk about the law and keeping little tiny pieces of the law while we ignore the other parts of it. Do we fail to understand the doctrines of forgiveness and grace because we don't want to apply the curse of sin to ourselves and admit what God has done to draw us to Christ? Third, we saw why God allows bad things that spoil our life resume. Because by allowing those things in our lives, God gets the greatest glory. Because only He is good and nobody can boast in His presence. And we saw that over in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 31. Fourth, shame. And if you're honest, and if you not just stuffed it and shoved it under the rug, shame is a powerful motivator when used the way God wants it to be used. And we saw the three different areas where God uses shame that a Christian faces. Fifth, be thankful when God allows you to put to shame, be put to shame for legitimate reasons. You know, there are legitimate reasons that all of us can be put to shame. I mean, legitimate reasons. Other people will try to put false shame on you, but there are all legitimate reasons for all of us. God uses the shame in our lives to burn out the garbage from our lives. He uses the shame to get rid of the evil because we feel that in our consciences. And then he uses it to conform us to the image of Christ. In that way, shame can be an intense blessing to cause you to live the rest of your life for Christ because you realize how badly you have offended a holy God. Until you understand the holiness of God, you will never understand your own sinful self. And that's what happened to Paul. That brought us to the things that we do not need to be ashamed of. There are many things about which we do not need to be ashamed that both inform, motivate, and empower the Christian life. We've looked at 18 of them. I'm not going to give you all the stuff we studied, but I'm going to list them for you. And I hope you took notes before, because here are 18 things, specific things, that you do not need to be ashamed of. And I'm not going to requote all the Bible verses. I hope you took those down when you took notes. I hope you took notes. Number one, we're not ashamed of the gospel, even if some people think it's foolish or a scandal. We saw that there were two reasons not to be ashamed of that. It's the power of God, and it provides eternal salvation. We saw that there were two groups of people to whom it's applied to the Jews and the Gentiles. Number two, we're not, as not ashamed because we have a hope that is motivated by love. Number three, we are not ashamed of our eschatology. The Christian is looking for the blessed hope. You don't need to be ashamed, even if most people in the so-called reform camp mock pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, uh, pre pre-tribulational eschatology. In other words, don't worry if people mock what you believe about the return of Jesus. Number four, we're not ashamed of living for Christ. The Christian expresses his heart hope in a visible lifestyle. Remember the text said, it's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. We're not ashamed of living for Christ. Number five, we're not ashamed because the Christian is looking for the hope of heaven. We saw lots of good verses on that. Number six, we're not ashamed because the Christian's hope is squarely centered in Christ and we are not ashamed of Jesus. All of these things are background for what Paul is doing here and why Paul is before the council. Number seven, we're not ashamed because the Christian's hope is firmly based in Scripture which cannot be broken. Number eight, we're not ashamed because the Christian's hope is guaranteed by God himself and is thus an anchor in the storms of life. We saw that in the book of Hebrews. Number nine, we are not ashamed because the Christian's hope is not based in the law. Give up on the business of trying to keep the law, folks. You can't do it. Nobody can do it. The law only condemns. It does not justify. It does not sanctify. It does not glorify. It condemns. It proves that you are a guilty sinner, that you are lost, that you are undone, that you are headed for hell, that you have no hope unless God himself provides the hope. We are not ashamed because our hope is not based on the law. We are not ashamed because the Christian is looking for the hope of service. The Christian is looking for the hope of rewards. You know, you can go and face a lot of things when you have the motivation that you're serving Christ. And when you know for sure that by serving Christ, you are going to get heavenly rewards that last forever. 
So you're not ashamed. You'll go right into the face of the devil himself because you know there's an eternal payback. Payday someday. A great and famous sermon by that name. You're not ashamed because the Christian is looking for the hope of leading others to Christ. You know, if you really understood what the value of an eternal soul is and what Jesus did to pay for that soul and if you have the love of Christ for those who are lost you will never be ashamed of Jesus when you tell other people about him because you might be the very instrument that God will use to bring that person to Christ. And yes, I believe in the doctrine of predestination, but you do not know who the elect are. They do not have pink polka dots on their noses. They do not have purple stripes on their shoulders. They do not have halos over their head that are still in the package, and you have to take off the package. Paul preached freely and openly to all, and he paid for it too, but he was not ashamed because of the hope of leading someone else to Christ. Number 12, we're not ashamed because the Christian's hope is his motivation for witnessing. Number 13, we're not ashamed because the Christian's expression of hope is supernaturally motivated and supernaturally driven. You can't do it on your own, folks. You can only do it in the power of the Spirit of God. Number 14, we're not ashamed because the Christian's hope is not a matter of self-persuasion or self-deception. It is given to us and overflows us by the power of God. As Paul stood before Ananias and the Sanhedrin Mafia that we talked about last week, there were additional reasons why he personally was not ashamed. He was not ashamed because of the Messianic prophetic fulfillment. Although rejected by Jews and rejected by the age of reason, he was not ashamed because he knew Jesus was the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy. Number 16, not being ashamed means living the Christian life openly and publicly. And Paul was doing it. Not being ashamed means, this is number 17, not being ashamed means being willing to suffer as a result of witnessing for Christ, not merely suffering for our own stupidity. Number 18, not being ashamed drives us. If this is not true of your life, it means you're ashamed. Not being ashamed means driving us to faithful study of and faithful application of the Scripture as God's workmen who don't need to be ashamed. Are you driven to the study of Scripture? If you're not, it may mean that there is some shame in your life that needs to be dealt with. Now, those are the things we do not need to be ashamed of, the things that transcend our life resume. Second, we study the things from our past which we are ashamed of. Paul talks about it in Romans 6.21. We won't list all of them, but I just give you the verse. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Part of the resume of each and every one of us is a resume that includes sin, and the wages of sin is death. That means all of us are going to die. Some of you went to a funeral this afternoon. All of us have been tainted by sin. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is not a just man upon the earth that sinneth not. Oh, that was all the way back in the Old Testament, book of Ecclesiastes. So part of our resume results in the inevitable results of sin, the wages of death. What made the difference? Romans 9 and 10 tell us, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief, a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now we closed last week. We talked about Paul's authority as a divine grant that he was not ashamed of. And we noted that a pastor, elder, and deacon does not need to be ashamed or timid about the divine authority granted to them in scripture. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 10. We'll not go over those verses again. And then we closed last week by noting that pastors, elders, and deacons must use their authority in precisely the manner that God ordains, not as a means of using the sheep for personal gain. Jesus said, feed my sheep. He did not say, eat my sheep. 
God's instructions for pastors, elders, and deacons are given in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. We covered those qualifications in detail in the past. We won't go into them again, but we asked the question last week. Did you take notes when we went through those qualifications? One at a time over 17 weeks. Actually, I think I took like 24 weeks because some of those I talked about for more than one week. 17 of them. 21 qualifications for elders. Same thing with the elders. One at a time over the many weeks. Do you have that list? Do you know what they are? They're not all listed in just one spot. They are scattered in three and sometimes four places. Primary places are 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. You get most of them there. You find some repeats and some extras. You find some others where Peter talks about them. You find others over in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6. You find a bunch of places where these things are listed and given to you. Do you have a list? Do you know what they are? Do you have them written down somewhere? If not, why not? We talked about the spiritual gifts that have to be had by each of those who are in authority. I preached a series on the 22 spiritual gifts to help you discern your personal spiritual gifts. Can you prove from Scripture which gifts you have? Can you list and accurately define the 22 spiritual gifts? Some of those are foundational, temporary sign gifts. Can you even list those seven? They're no longer being given today, but they're the ones that are very popular in the charismatic movement. Can you list the temporary gifts and define them accurately? If not, why not? And I reminded you last week in closing that you're not going to get another shot at some of that material. You need to eat the food when it gets put on the table. So that brings us tonight to verses 11 through 22 in Acts chapter 23. Little pictures have big ears. Now that little phrase, little pictures have big ears, was an old saying from the 1800s that my grandmother used to quote to me when I was a teeny tiny little boy. And I heard her saying it to my mother occasionally. When my mom would start talking about something, my grandmother would interrupt her and say, little pictures have big ears, and then she'd look at me with this knowing sort of a look. <laughs> what it means is be careful what you say and do because the children are listening and watching. Little pictures have big ears. The children are listening and watching. Just like a melt pitcher has a big handle, little kids have big ears, and they're soaking up everything that you say as they build their own framework for life. They listen to you and they watch you. That brings us to the introductory material for our text tonight where we see a very brave little boy carrying out a man's assignment. Now, it's a young man here, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. I suspect personally that this child was less than 10 years old, perhaps as young as 6. I'll give you some reasons for that as we go through the text. But you know something, if you look at that little boy, what he does here in this text, he was a child who had learned two things. He had learned courage, and he had learned character. Guys, have you learned courage and character? You think you're brave, you want to stand up to the bully, but have you learned character? Courage and character. You know, he probably learned that from his mom. Moms have always had a rather important influence in the life of their children. Like the old saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. You know, it's interesting as you look at this, because this child had also seen courage and character someplace else. He'd seen courage and character in his uncle, Paul was his uncle, according to our text. It was the son of Paul's sister who went and spoke to the centurion. That was Paul's nephew. Paul was his uncle. <clears throat> He'd seen that courage and character in his uncle. You know something? You don't have to be a dad or a mom to influence a child. Some of you in here are not dads or moms. You do not have to be a dad or a mom to influence a child. Paul obviously had made an impact on the life of this child. You know, I have a friend who's serving Christ overseas in an atheistic country. His wife and daughter are with him. His daughter has taken a great interest in her niece, who is a young teen, and within this past month had the privilege of leading her to Christ. 
a child who's grown up in a totally atheistic society where God is hated. An uncle, an aunt, can have the kind of impact that Paul had on this young man. You'll notice something else, that it was not the dad who went to the centurion. It was not the mom who went to the centurion, and there are reasons for that that we'll look at later. It was a little boy who could be trusted. Did you know that there are children that you can trust? We don't believe that here in America. But there are children that can be trusted. Think about when you were a child. Could you have been trusted with this assignment? It's a kind of scary assignment. You're going to a Goy fortress. A Goy is a Gentile. The Goyim, the nations. You're a kid who's a Jew. And you're going to the oppressors. In fact, to the mean military guys. What are they going to do to you? This is a little boy who had courage and character. What would have happened to him? Could he really be trusted? Would they mock him? Would they perhaps throw him in the clink too? Hey, go visit your uncle and stay with him for a while. Could you have been trusted with that assignment, which might actually have cost you your life, or the life of your dad and your mom? Or the life of your uncle that you sort of hero worshipped. Let me ask you another question. Do you remember ever being entrusted with a truly serious responsibility when you were a child? Or did your parents sort of smile and perhaps even joke about you being an irresponsible little kid? I praise God that my parents didn't treat me that way. You know, my parents were of the very old school. They expected me to excel. There's no question of it. They expected me to excel. They provided the setting for me to excel, including things that were very sacrificially painful to them emotionally and financially. They sent me off to a private boarding school 1,500 miles away from my home when I was 11 years old. I went to Stony Brook School for Boys, and I can still remember standing at the top of, Park, of Chapman Parkway near the flagpole area as my dad drove away, and I was 11 years old, and my father told me he wept all the way back to Texas. My parents expected me to excel, and they made the sacrifices that were necessary for me to excel. They expected me to excel academically, athletically, musically, artistically. I won major awards in all of those areas as a high school student. I set many course records, including the course record as a high school senior at West Point Military Academy. We ran against the Army every year and we beat them three years in a row on their home course. I set the course record. I won the Ivy League Championship. I ran in races at Van Cortlandt Park in New York City where there were over 600 guys on the starting line and won from many different schools. My parents expected me to excel. They didn't take excuses. They expected me to excel. And you know that built something into my character, for which I'm very thankful. I graduated from high school at age 17. Most of my classmates were graduating at 18 and 19. Then I went through college in three years and graduated from college at age 20, when the rest of my classmates were 22 and 23 years old. I excelled there. I set the course record in cross country there. I won art awards there. I designed the freshman class float. Our theme for homecoming floats that year, every class had to have a float that was in a competition. And the theme that year was victory through sacrifice. And I designed a Trojan horse that stood 30 feet tall. And our class built it. And that theme, we won that year. 
My parents expected me to excel. I then completed five years of master degrees programs in four years. You know, Judy's parents expected the same kind of performance from her. She completed college in three years with a greater than a 4.0 average. She completed a master's degree in one year and had to run through tear gas to turn in her master's thesis because Ohio State University, where she earned that degree, was overrun with striking students and National Guardsmen. Her parents expected great things from her. They were not disappointed. You know something? I benefited from that. They formed the Christ-like character that she reflected all the way through our marriage up to her death. Friends, children want, except the most recalcitrant of them, children want to grow up to be responsible adults. Little boys want to grow up to be like their daddies. Little girls want to grow up to be like their mommies. It's the adults who give the children the idea that children are not responsible. And you know what? Children conform to adult expectations. And they also conform to the rotten character of their classmates in public schools. That's one of the reasons that homeschooling is so powerful, not merely because it's academically superior, and all the tests prove that homeschooling is far academically superior to the rot that you get in public schools. Indeed, it is academically superior. But the real reason is because the parents have the amazing opportunity to form the character of Christ in the child. Never forget, God gave children to parents. God did not give children to the state. Although, did you know that there are some states in the United States that say children are the wards of the state? Every communist country in the world says children are the wards of the state. They don't belong to the parents. They belong to the state. To be molded and shaped for the state's benefit. Friends, children are given by God to parents not to the state. And God holds the parents accountable for developing and molding the character of Christ in their children. We see a young man here, a little boy, in this text, who had obviously been taught character and courage. Oh, I hope that if you have influence in the life of a child, you are teaching them the character of Christ. Do you even know the 49 specific character qualities of Jesus Christ that should be taught to a child, there are 49 of them. There are probably others, but there are certainly 49 that are clear and up front. Have you ever bothered to study what they are? If you don't know what they are, how in the world will you ever be able to teach them to your children? <coughs> parents used to entrust incredible things to their children, and because the parents knew how to teach character, Parents expected those things. Parents used to expect things from their children because they had taught them the character. I've been recently thinking about this in relation to the great Baroque and classical musicians. That happens to be one of my pastimes and hobbies. Mozart was writing major symphonies as a child, age six. Symphonies. Say, well, he was an idiot savant. That means a, a very talented and gifted child. Yes, that's true. But his father expected something of him because he had gifts. Have you studied your children to find out what their gifts are? Or your grandchildren? Or your nieces and nephews to find out what their gifts are? I used to study my children after they were born. I would study my children to see what gifts God had given them. I had one son who I watched as he carefully made tiny little violins and pianos out of scraps of wood. And this stupid old man thought to himself, you know what? I bet that kid is interested in pianos and violins. So I bought him a cheap violin. I got the violin, the bow, and the case for a hundred bucks. That, friends, is a cheap violin. And it was brand new. <laughs> a very cheap violin. 
He practiced four, five, and six hours a day without us pushing him because he loved it. Study your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, the young people in whose lives you can make an impact. I can tell you lots of other incredible stories about that boy. Have you done it? God has gifted them, you know, not merely with natural talents, but also with spiritual gifts which will begin to blossom as that child comes to Christ and you have the impact and the opportunity to give character training and teach them courage to use it for Jesus. Some of Mozart's work lasting more than two centuries was produced when he was five and six years old. Johann Sebastian Bach was writing extraordinary music when he was less than ten. Mendelssohn was writing major symphonic works when he was eleven and twelve years old. Rossini was writing major musical compositions when he was twelve. And the list goes on and on and on. Now, occasionally I listen to a classical radio program where the children from third grade through twelfth grade are performing some of the most difficult music ever written on violin, viola, wind instruments, brass instruments with an expertise that ranks among conservatory students. And they often are interviewed after they've played on this radio program. They're interviewed and give a quote testimony and you know what? It almost always includes a statement to the effect that their parents not only encouraged them in the endeavor, but listen carefully, their parents expected it of them. We got a little boy in our text tonight. I'm telling you this because this is not an isolated instance in the history of the world. Parents, you have no idea what loving parental expectation does to motivate a child who wants to please the parent. Children are built with that inside of them. We as parents are the ones who destroy it. But almost every child desperately wants to please that big person. Wow, he's big. Wow, I want to do something that will make him happy. It's the way little kids are. I had 13 of them, I know. They want to please the parents. Judy and I tried to exercise that kind of loving expectation with our children. And as you know, God graciously motivated them to all to excel. You saw some of that in the prayer sheet this morning that was in your bulletin. Now that brings us back to things that bring shame to a parent and to their children and things that each of us should be ashamed of. Things for which a Christian should be ashamed and which the church is required to excommunicate this type of person specifically for the purpose of bringing them to shame. And if you don't do it, what are you doing? You're excusing. We talked about that this morning in child rearing, about excusing things, and so the children go ahead and do those things because the church doesn't act in church discipline. I'll give you some illustrations. You've not heard these before, so I'll go ahead and give them now. Second Thessalonians 3.11 for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. Now that's an interesting Greek word. It means lazily. Ever known anybody who was lazy? Yeah. Working not at all, but are busybodies. They're lazy when it comes to doing anything profitable. But boy, do they, they are so energetic when it goes around to sticking their nose into other people's business. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Quit looking for handouts. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. That's the kind of people that can wear you out. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man. Ah, you are supposed to select him out and have no company with him. You exclude him first of all. What's the purpose? That he may be ashamed. Remember we talked about that, how shame is such a powerful motivating factor. God has given us each, Romans chapter 2, a conscience. Now some people continue in sin so long that they sear their conscience. Peter talks about that. But the average person still has a conscience. 
And when we as believers function the way we're supposed to function, it brings the person to shame. We're supposed to rebuke them. Remember we talked about that this morning? That they may be ashamed. Same thing here in our text tonight. That brings us back to the question of how to deal with a lazy brother. We talked about that several weeks ago. Next, there are some things we do not need to be ashamed of. Never be ashamed of another Christian who is suffering for Christ, but be warned that it might happen to you too. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians 4.9, For I, th thank, I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world. They put you up on the stage, they focus the cameras on you, and they say, Aren't you an idiot? We're made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. And Paul speaks with tongue in cheek, but year wise. This is the Corinth, remember? Corinth, the church that was so filled with sin you couldn't even walk through it. We are weak, but you are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even under this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. That doesn't sound like a fun kind of a lifestyle, does it? And labor, working with our own hands. Paul could have been fully supported. He certainly, of all the people who are preachers, evangelists, church planters, missionaries, in all of history, he certainly ought to have been supported. We labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. See, Paul didn't mind having false shame heaped on him by the world because he knew he was serving Jesus. And then he says something very gentle and kind. I write not these things to shame you, although I should have, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. If you follow my example, and Paul tells us elsewhere that he was an example. Remember we talked about that under type where he's the pattern and you put the paper on top and the light shines through and you trace around the pattern so that you get the exact replica. Paul was their pattern. And he says, as my beloved sons, I warn you, Paul was involved in child training. There are also many other sins for which we'll be ashamed of the coming of Christ if we refuse to repent. Let me just give some of them to you. We haven't gone over this list. Here's some that will be ashamed of the coming of Christ. Church failure to discipline moral sin in church fights. 1 Corinthians 6, 5, I speak to your shame. Is it so there's not a wise man among you, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? Here's one. I'm going to offend everybody in here tonight. Women in the church who refuse to wear head coverings. 1 Corinthians 11.6 and 11.14 For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Long-haired men and uncovered women. That's why Judy always wore a head covering. From the time I met her, we talked about this passage. She said, yes, I will gladly do that because of 1 Corinthians 11. Third thing, shame in the church. Believers coming to the Lord's table in a state of carnality. 1 Corinthians 11.22 What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not. What shall I say? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Women talking in church. 1 Corinthians 14.35 And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. How about failure to use every opportunity to witness for Christ? 1 Corinthians 15.34 Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You haven't been telling them. Those are things that are shameful. How about gossiping about moral sin? You hear somebody did something and boy, that's a juicy tidbit. And boy, do you want to pass that on? You can hardly wait to get on the phone and talk and tell everybody about it. Gossiping about moral sin? Listen to Ephesians 5.12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. 
other shameful things in the church. Gluttony, bragging about past sins, focusing on earthly, or earthly things. Philippians 3.19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Another area of shame that some believers do, bringing shame to Christ by going back to their old ways that they had when they were unsaved. Hebrews 6.6, if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. What will keep the believer from these types of shame before both God and before the watching world? The answer is found in John chapter 15. The answer is abiding in Christ will keep you from being ashamed when Jesus returns at the rapture. Not just being saved, but abiding in Christ. Do you know how to do that? Do you even know what it means? 1 John 2.28 says, Now little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. John tells you that is the key, which Jesus expounded on an entire chapter in John chapter 15, part of the Upper Room Discourse, chapters 14, 15, and 16, or what's called the Upper Room Discourse, where Jesus is teaching the disciples the things that they need to know when he goes away from them back into heaven. John 15 deals with abiding in Christ, the fruit and the vine and the branches. Abide in him that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That's a major message in the theme, the theme of the message of Christ. Here in 1 John, John remembers what Jesus taught in that upper room discord. Do you know the five stages of fruit bearing? People, I give you lists all the time. Things that, you know, I had a teacher in Israel, a wonderful teacher, who taught us all kinds of things about the history of Israel, not just the biblical history, but all the way through history, all the way up to the modern day. And he gave us what he called pegs to hang things on. And these pegs were specific dates with specific events so that if you learned those particular key events, everything else would come into focus and you'd be able to understand what was going on. That's why I give you lists. Because they are pegs that you can hang things on to test where you are in your spiritual life. Do you know the five levels of fruit bearing? The five stages? You know, there's not much discussion on the first three stages of fruit bearing. We talk a lot about the last two stages, but not much about the first two, the first three. In John chapter 15, if you want to write these down, they're short. You can put them on down on that note sheet that I gave you. Stage one is bearing no fruit. That's verse two. That's where we all start. Bearing no fruit. The second one is also listed in verse 2. In fact, all three of the first three are listed in verse 2. The second one is bearing some fruit. That's there in verse 2. The third one is bearing more fruit. No fruit, some fruit, more fruit. Then you find the next one mentioned in two verses, verses 5 and 8. Bearing much fruit. And the last one is where we're going for tonight because we talked about abiding in Christ. Number five is bearing abiding or remaining fruit. That's verse 16. Bearing abiding or remaining fruit. Fruit that doesn't wither. Jude talks about those who bear fruit that withers. They're twice dead, plucked up by the roots. bearing abiding or remaining fruit regardless of what happens in the world around you. That's what Paul is bearing in the passage we're looking at tonight. Let me read you that passage out of John 15. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Now listen to what Jesus says if you're in those initial categories where you're not bearing any fruit, you're just bearing a little bit. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. You know, a football coach will never leave a player on the field who keeps running touchdowns for the other team. He gets the ball, gets confused, runs the wrong direction, crosses the, the other team's goal line. 
His own teammates are trying to tackle him. What's the coach going to do? He's going to pull him off the field. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, here you're bearing some fruit, but you haven't borne a whole lot yet, it says he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Purging deals with chastening. God cuts off the rubbish in our lives, the branches that don't have fruit on them, so that the branches that are bearing fruit will have more of the sap flowing into them so that they will bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. Ah, here's the key. Do you want to bear fruit? Do you want to bear lasting fruit? Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. That means you are intimately grafted into the vine. There's no separation at any point of day or night. You have the constant flow of the Spirit of God in your life as He produces, even in your sleep. Do you know what? I don't even control what's going on in your sleep. I mean, many times I wake up in the middle of the night and I have songs of praise that are running through my mind and I start singing. You say, yeah, the pastor is a nut. <laughs> he really is crazy. I know that. But you know what? That's where my mind is focused all the time. I wake up and start praying for somebody and I have no idea why, I have to, why God brought that person to my mind, but I pray for them right then. They can be halfway around the world and some of them are. If you're abiding in Christ, there is a constant flow through you of the Spirit of God to produce fruit in your life. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. You know, this passage is the theme passage for the Alliance Defending Freedom, of which I am an attorney. I am an associated and allied attorney with the Alliance Defending Freedom. Abiding in Christ is their theme. They can't do anything, and they understand that in the legal realm, without Christ, without abiding in Jesus. That's their theme. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. If you practice the principles of abiding in Christ, it guarantees, Jesus himself said so, that you will bring forth much fruit. You know what the fruit of the Spirit is. The Apostle Paul lists it for you. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Is that what characterizes your life? It doesn't talk about the, the works, but the fruit of the Spirit. There will be certain works that show up in your life, but the fruit of the Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking about here, fruit coming from the vine. Without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. They are rubbish. God doesn't like branches that don't bear fruit. Did you get that? If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Ah, there's something that goes on on our end of the deal. My words abide in you. How much of God's word do you know? Now, I know you know a bunch of Bible verses. I think you all know John 3.16. We probably know a few other verses that all of us could quote together. But how much of God's word abides in you. You know the Bible stories, but how much of God's Word, not just the stories, how much of God's Word abides in you? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know it's profitable. profitable. Do you know what the things are that it's profitable for? Can you quote them? For doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. You see, 
when it abides in you, it comes out in your life. Oh, it's an incredible passage here. Something else in terms of prayer promises. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, a lot of people grab the last half of that verse, and they pay no attention to the first half of that verse. Because when you're abiding in Christ and his word abides in you, you know what? The desires of your heart are going to be conformed to his will. And so the things that you ask for will be according to his will and not according to your fleshly desires and motivations. Abiding in Christ, his word abiding in you, you can ask what you will. If we ask anything according to his will, John says, he heareth us. How do you know it's his will? Because you're abiding in Christ and his word is abiding in you. And God never does anything that is contrary to his word. His will is always in conformity with his word. Not with our desires, but with his word. So it's as you abide in Christ and as his word abides in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That's what Jesus is promising here. Herein is my Father glorified. You see, Jesus' goal was to glorify the Father. Our goal, if we follow Jesus, should be to glorify the Father. When you abide in Christ and his word abides in you, Jesus says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. You want to call yourself a disciple of Christ? A learner? One who follows Jesus in all the ways that you think and say and do, your motives, your attitudes, your actions? abide in Christ, his word abiding in you, you'll bear a lot of fruit. That means that you don't keep getting pruned, you don't keep getting chastened. And then you can be called one of his disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. You know, we've just gotten love, joy, and peace here in this passage. Fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And here's the last one, that your fruit should remain. That's the remaining fruit. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. If you've got remaining fruit, you know what? You're going to get prayer requests that are answered because you're going to be praying for the right things. These things I command you. Did you know this is not optional? John 15 is not optional. It's one of the commands of Christ. Jesus talked about obeying his commandments, keeping his commandments. John 15 tells you what they are. And the key one he summarizes last, that you love one another. The thing that keeps churches from splitting. Now, question, did you take notes on that? Can you list the five stages of fruit bearing in John 14 through 16, the Upper Discourse? Things to teach your children, your nephews and nieces, the young people that you have influence on their lives. We find that there was a little boy, and we're going to talk this only part one. We've got the first half of it tonight, and I actually got through my notes tonight. I can't believe that. Ran six minutes over, but that's okay. <laughs> a little boy who'd been taught courage and character. And God used him in a mighty way to save the life of the Apostle Paul, a kid was used to save the life of the Apostle Paul from professional assassins. A child who was trustworthy. A child who had learned self-control and discipline. A child who knew what was right and wrong and chose to do right. Guys, are you like that? I hope so. We have some little boys here tonight. Young men. Learn the character of Christ and see how God uses you. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you'll take your word as it has gone forth tonight and use it in a powerful way in each of our lives, that each one of us might abide in Christ and his words abide in us so that we can ask what we will and it will be done unto us. Because that's the way in which the Father is glorified because that will bring forth not only much fruit, but abiding fruit. 
Father, again we thank you for this, your word, and pray that you'll bless it to our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 92. Oh, how 